question. I just um, I would like to uh, announce that um, one of the talks has been uh, cancelled, namely the talk just at the, uh, after the lunch, the talk by uh, Mr. Tanas Hyucic. Wow. About explanation and truth making. So I will make many mistakes in pronouncing names. But let me check. I uh, know that uh, the first speaker after me is um, present. Um, um, of the others, uh, who else of the, uh, is uh, also in the afternoon um, giving a talk? Is there already somebody? That will you give a talk? You? My Mr. Mayer is my Estro. Sorry? So I, you're, I give a talk after. Yes, you're Maya Estro. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the answer, well, at least I have seen on the conference Adriana Schitz. Mm -hmm. um, so I know she is here. And let's hope that the others are also here and will um, show up um, in time. But, well, we just see what happens. Um, okay, and I will be here in the room. I have the key of the room, so in the um, in the break, in the lunch break, I will close the uh, the room, um, and I will be back. Uh, well, you know, much in time for um, the, the afternoon session, um, so that. Um, when you present that you can uh, make it um, uh, put the, your talk on this computer when you use the computer. Um, okay, um, now my uh, contribution uh, to this symposium, my um, indeed um, quite um, long exposition, I hope um, that, um, well I, I certainly think manage and um, to go through it but and feel free to interrupt when you do not um, understand some of the questions of clarification certainly feel free to raise them um, okay this is a survey of what I'm going to do uh, as in the abstract mentioned well the stage on explanation in the analytical philosophy of science was set by Ernest Nagel and um, in uh, chapter 2 of his book, The Structure of Science. Um, I will start with that. Then, in a way, the body of the talk will be um, a division um, of two kinds of explanation that I think is very useful to make in order to get hold on the various kinds of more specific kinds of explanation and uh, uh, they are entitled explanation by subsumption that's more or less a common term but also the other type is explanation by specification and um, um, after that I will refer to later re developments uh, which I will relate to my uh, main division so let me uh, bring things together. Well, so as I said, the, the, uh, the book, The Structure of Science, I think, well, at least in the 60s up to the 80s, it was uh, one of the main advanced introductions to philosophy of science. And it set the stage indeed for, uh, in particular, the topic on um, uh, explanation. He distinguished uh, four kinds, deductive, probabilistic, uh, functional and um, genetic or historical explanation as it is also called. And um, moreover he paid attention to specific cases as causal explanation um, and reduction, reductive explanation. And with this um, in, um, 
in mind. He, for instance, was the um, very much uh, followed and filled in and sophist made more sophisticated by uh, Karl Hempel, um, and in particular with his book Aspects of Scientific Explanation, in which he distinguished two main types, deductive nomological and inductive statistical explanation. Uh, I, oh, there is, for some reason or other, okay. Um, now, um, I took a lead in my uh, Structures in Science, um, a book appeared in 2001. I took um, this, um, um, respect, this chapter of patterns of scientific explanation of Nagel as point of departure for um, a kind of reordering of the landscape, uh, making this distinction between uh, explanation by subsumption and explanation by uh, specification. Now, explanation by the subsumption, um, that's, well, could also be called nomological explanation, uh, and of that type, you can further distinguish um, deductive nomological, uh, probabilistic nomological, and which has, well, I think that was, at least um, as far as I know, not very clearly stated in the literature, approximative nomological explanation. Um, and these kind of explanations may or may not be causal explanations, and they may or may not be reductive explanations. That depends on more specific aspects. This on the one side, and on the other side, explanation by specification, the other main category, which leaves room for not only a functional explanation as Nagel, um, um, uh, recognize, uh, uh, as a, a separate kind of explanation, but also something like intentional explanation and a particular type of causal explanation. So, uh, the idea is that what, what brings these kinds of explanations together? Because they have a particular global logical structure, as opposed to um, Nomological explanation, they have also a particular log logical structure, but different from explanation by specification. Um, so, let's now, well, well, what I already alluded to, what I will do is main lines of this um, main division, and the, uh, what the idea is behind these kind of explanation, and then try to place later developments in um, the context of that main division and uh, well, I'll repeat once more the, the names of the authors that will at least briefly be uh, indicated. Now first, explanation by subsumption and uh, that it may also be called nomological explanation and that can refer to the explanation of an individual event or a general, uh, a general law, a general fact the general fact is, of course, a kind of law, uh, not always, but usually an empirical law. Um, and such facts are subsumed under a law or a theory. And as is almost always the case, not just one theory, you need a number of auxiliary hypotheses uh, to get really a, a deductive story or a more or less at least a convincing story uh, around. Um, and in the case of explaining individual events, you need also individ uh, initial conditions um, in order to get the argument. Uh, okay, so, and then we get this division in three types, exp um, the kinds of relations between premises, the explanants, and the conclusion, the explanandum, deductive, approximative, and probabilistic. And we will, um, especially the first two, will get some attention. Now, let me present just one example 
Um, it looks a bit formal, but uh, I think I hope with, the, with my clarification it becomes uh, transparent. It is the main line of the argument of, uh, behind the explanation of the <coughs> ideal gas law um, uh, by the kinetic theory of gases. So, the ideal gas law in one um, form, uh, standard form, it reads as uh, PV uh, is equal to RT. Well, the pressure, you have a container of gas, and the pressure you can measure with a manometer, and times the volume of the container, and assuming that we have a standard amount of gas, mole of gas, for instance, then that product is equal to a, a certain constant, R, the gas, ideal gas constant, times the temperature, but then in the, the absolute temperature, so with uh, corresponding to, for instance, the, 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 the zero degree corresponds to minus 273 uh, degrees of Celsius. Um, how to explain this with the kinetic theory of gases, KTG? Well, that theory says the following. A, a, a container of gas, the gas should be seen as a huge amount of uh, rapidly moving uh, molecules in all directions and they bump into each other, but they also bump with the wall. And what produces, so to speak, the, uh, the pressure uh, that is the result of all these uh, bumps with the wall. And um, now, if you start with looking at one particular collision of a particular molecule with the wall, you can, using the, um, uh, the so the kinetic theory says, this is a Newtonian affair, such a, a um, collision is a, a Newtonian collision. So what happens if the molecule um, reaches the wall, it, as far as the velocity is concerned in the direction of the wall, it will return in, with the same velocity but in the other direction. It is an elastic collision. That you assume that is a very important uh, auxiliary hypothesis. Um, but if you assume this, you can uh, deduce that the result of this uh, push is a kind of exchange of so-called momentum, and you can just calculate with Newtonian means that each collision um, uh, leads to a kind of uh, pulse exchange um, of two times the mass of a molecule, we assume all molecules of the same kind, have the same mass, times the velocity um, in the direction of the wall. So two times the Q is two times M and the velocity in the direction of the wall. That's the first important step. What we now have done is applying the Newtonian theory to one individual collision. The next step is to aggregate this result because all these bumps at the wall we have uh, to, so to speak, add together and uh, derive um, what the total result is of all these bumps. And for that we need a number of statistical hypotheses about that it is really random uh, in all directions and in all areas in the container, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the average velocity is um, uh, everywhere roughly the same. If we make this assumption, then we can deduce, and this was a very important historical result, to, to add in a sophisticated way these all these, the result of these bumps leads to the, um, the result that the pressure 
uh, in the, the, now I, I write a small p indicating that I'm now talking about uh, not so much, not yet the, the macroscopic pressure, but the pressure that results from all these bumps, so the kinetic pressure, um, that, that times the volume is equal to uh, 2 over 3 uh, times the number of molecules in a standard uh, amount, n, the number of Avogadro as it is known, times the average um, uh, uh, kinetic energy of a molecule, and that's defined as uh, half times the mass of a molecule times the average, and I could not use the proper symbol so that for, for the, that I read uh, average, uh, uh, the average square of the velocity. Um, so now we have a result on the collective level, but still uh, in, in kinetic terms, in microscopic terms, we have uh, added microscopic uh, things to a collective result. And now the third step is the identification, uh, where we say, well, this kinetic pressure, this small p, that is precisely what we measure uh, when we measure the pressure by a manometer. So p is uh, small p is large p, is identical to large p. And similarly, but it's a little bit more complicated, this mean kinetic energy can be equated with uh, the expression you see, 3 over 2 times, and now these two constants we occur r over n, times the um, absolute temperature, which is also a macroscopic uh, notion. Now this, this second identification may seem quite um, well, a trick just to make the formulas fit together, but um, a more detailed analysis made clear that this is really a very well justifiable um, um, assumption uh, to say really the mean kinetic energy is equal to, is identical to the expression on the right. But if you use that and uh, take that together with the um, collective law we uh, reached in the second stage, we can now just uh, calculate PV is RT, the ideal gas law. So we have now derived from the kinetic theory and the number of auxiliary hypotheses, step specific hypotheses, that um, the kinetic, the, the, the ideal gas law will be the case. And this last step is called the identification or a more general transformation. And now, in general, this is a, a, rep, well, a representative example of um, explanations of laws by theories, at least in the natural sciences, but not only in the natural sciences. So, for instance, the uh, law of free fall of Galilei, the ideal gas law, crossing laws of Mendel, um, uh, laws in the sphere of uh, economics, uh, Olson and Olson's law of collective goods. Um, um, they can be derived from theories using um, a limited number of characteristic steps. And we came across three, uh, application, um, aggregation and uh, identification. But in other examples, there are uh, two other steps that can also occur, namely that not, for instance, not so much the transformation by an identification takes place, but uh, by a causal correlation, by making a causal claim instead of an identity claim to bring uh, two vocabularies together. And second, what also occurs in many cases when you get an approximative nomological explanation, uh, without the last step, the approximation, you get a deductive nomological explanation, but with the last step you make an approximation. Uh, for instance, you need that in deriving uh, Galileo's law of free fall from 
the theory of Newton, then it is an approximative explanation. So these steps, together with step-specific step auxiliary hypothesis, and assuming, well, these, um, that the formal relations are uh, deductive or at least approximative, or in another extension, probabilistic, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the empirical condition, assuming that you have good reasons to assume that the theory and the um, auxiliary hypothesis, that they are true, or at least close to the truth. Um, then you have a, a, a successful explanation. Usually the law to be explained is an empirical or an observational law, but that even need not be the case. Now, um, let's... Um, when is this kind of explanation, um, according to this five-step model, um, called a reduction? Well, in the literature it turns out that there are many reasons, or at least three reasons, to talk about reduction. It just you can show that by, by examples. If the aggregation step occurs, people talk about reduction. If an identification occurs, the same. And even if an approximation step occurs, uh, that is, um, one speaks um, about um, a reduction. And in other cases, so if only application and correlation, causal correlation occur, one speaks, for instance, about a correlative um, or a, um, a certain kind of causal explanation. And there has been enormous debate about um, reduction and relief, um, in, in all, um, fights almost, and I think they can be clarified a lot because of the confusion that there are different reasons to call a re an explanation um, a, um, a reduction. So far for explanation by subsumption. Um, no explanation by um, specification. And here again are the three, at least three forms, um, intentional, functional, and uh, a specific kind of cause of explanation. Um, well, uh, how do they come together? Um, in an intentional explanation, what is done is an, an explanation is made of a um, uh, uh, primarily of that a certain individual has performed a certain action and that's explained in terms of a, a, his or her beliefs and desires so you get the belief desire action uh, principle um, this intentional explanation is also used in, in a metaphorical sense in biology for instance that very um, one speaks about very um, let's say not um, not low organisms, even there they are, um, um, one speaks about that uh, this warm wants so and so and etc. But that's of course very metaphorical. Now the idea is there is a general, more general structure behind this kind of explanation uh, and for instance functional explanations in for, uh, for instance biology have a, uh, a similar structure, a similar global structure. Um, uh, so in biology you have the, a, um, that certain traits, certain behavior, or certain um, uh, organ uh, organs that we assign a function to them. That um, is very important, but it's also it occurs in sociology and psychology. And finally, in particular when we have the causal explanation of, a, of an accident, of some kind of accident, then we have then the, the nature of the explanation that we give as a very uh, specific kind and is indeed um, uh, comparable to uh, logical form uh, with the previous ones. 
And by the way, um, about um, um, this common structure, um, well, well, let me say this remark later. Um, let's um, use an example about an intentional explanation, it's not on the screen, but uh, which is used in a very well problematic way by Nagel in his uh, chapter 2, why did um, uh, Henry VIII, uh, the king of England, in, uh, well, maybe uh, I don't know exactly when, but he wanted to divorce, he divorced. And the idea was that he did so because he wanted to get a male heir, a male son, a son that could uh, become his successor. And um, uh, at that time, at least, it was inconceivable that a woman would be the successor. So he wanted to um, uh, marry again with um, another woman, so he had to divorce. And that essentially was the start for the, um, of, for the Anglican uh, Church. What is involved in such an explanation when you look more carefully? Well, in the end, we come to very specific statements like Henry VIII performed this action of divorce uh, with the intention of getting in this way a male heir. Um, and we need a meaning decomposition of uh, such a statement and a first approximation that is um, that this a person performs that action with the following reasons. For he desires a certain goal and he believes that his action is not, perhaps not necessary, perhaps not sufficient, but at least useful for the goal he or she wants to uh, approach. That's a very specific statement with a specific meaning. We have also the unspecific statement unspecific intentional statement saying that um, um, a P performs A intentionally. A person performs an action intentionally. Uh, and by that we mean that, well, there is some goal, maybe we do not yet know which one, but that goal is the one that is approached by uh, this act, uh, this, the agent, in order uh, with this particular action. So there is a goal such that P performs this action with the intention of approaching goal gamma. And then we can put up the following um, thought process in terms of questions and answers. And here comes the relation with the work of Andrei Wisniewski, which uh, is in the audience. I. Um, uh, I gave a similar talk, I think, in, in 92 or so in Poznan, and then uh, Andre immediately noticed that uh, there was a strong link with his theory about question and answers. So uh, that uh, in the end, uh, we made together a paper where these, my story about explanation by specification and uh, the erotetic logic of Andrei Wyshevsky was combined. So here is roughly the, um, the thought process. Um, we notice a certain, the fact that a certain person performs a certain action. It raises the why question. Why did he or she do this? It, uh, we pose uh, almost immediately the unspecific hypothesis, well, he or she will do it intentionally. People usually do not think without any intention. And the question is, um, be creative and find an idea how, what is, was the intention of that action? And you formulate specific hypothesis for that intention and try to derive test implications from that specific hypothesis and, well, it may lead to well, clear evidence that that was certainly not the intention of the actor. Um, 
um, it uh, maybe in the case of Henri VIII, there was no reason to assume that he did not like his uh, uh, his wife, but he um, but that 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 was apparently not the reason. Um, that's one possibility. Then you have to invent a new hypothesis, a new specific hypothesis. But it may also be that you get very good evidence for your specific hypothesis. For instance, in the uh, diary of a certain person that he just wrote down that he had this kind of problem and wanted to achieve so and so, that you get a convincing uh, answer, what, an answer to the why question. It was gold G. At that moment, you have reached. You have really new information, and on that basis, as a kind of sidestep, you can conclude, well, okay, the unspecific hypothesis uh, is apparently true, uh, he, the actor did uh, perform the action intentionally. That's what we st st uh, uh, thought already at the beginning, and we have now uh, really verified that that is the case. So that's a, a officially, um, this is a, an existential generalization. But of course it leads to other questions. Such an answer leads to new questions. Why precisely is um, a, a male um, her, her, a, uh, was that uh, needed to get a successor? Well, in that time, etc. no female uh, could become uh, came uh, yet, etc. These kind of additional questions. So, if you have rounded off an intentional explanation, does not mean that all questions are solved. Okay. Now, we have the global structure of an intentional explanation. Believe me that you can tell a similar story on um, in, um, a, um, a, a functional explanation, but that might now immediately go to. Um, uh, the uh, causal explanation. Uh, well, uh, a typical example is um, um, to be explained is the event of the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. Well, we all know that. Well, the, the answer is um, there was a tsunami uh, which. Um, Produce such a flood of water in the nuclear plant uh, that it was completely uh, destroyed. The normal functioning was destroyed. And, well, the tsunami itself was caused by uh, well, the earthquake in the sea, is also, is, always called, is also called a sea quake. We know these kind of um, answers, but let's see whether indeed this kind of structure reoccurs. We have the specific causal statement. Um, an event in a certain system in a nuclear plant occurred due to a specific cause, the tsunami. Um, the main key, the, the meaning of this kind of complex statement is the event occurred in that system. Um, the, um, this um, uh, condition C, this cause C, uh, is a very abnormal factor. A tsunami is not an everyday phenomenon. Um, and there is a causal law to the following. There are normal factors besides this abnormal one that together uh, a causal law guarantees um, that if this abnormal factor and this the, uh, the normal factors apply, then uh, a disaster will occur. So, um, and then we get the, the meaning of an unspecific cause, and so we, we immediately say when an accident occurs, uh, some special thing occurs to a system, um, well, there will be a specific cause. And the meaning of that statement is, um, uh, it will be caused by some abnormal factor, is also a, a way of saying. There is a gamma such that it occurs uh, in S due to the specific cause. There are many causal factors involved, but it is, the interest is in the abnormal factor. An insurance company 
is not interested in the normal factors, but is interested in what went wrong, so to speak. Um, so now you can put up a similar thought process um, as that for inter intentional explanation. Um, yeah, I, I just I did not write it out here, but so you can also say, well, you start with the why question, why did the disaster occur, and then you formulate specific hypotheses and try to test them, falsification, you have to do, invent new hypothesis, verification, you can indeed conclude, um, well, um, to that uh, specific um, a statement, and, and as a side conclusion, you can say, yeah, it's true what we already thought, um, there must be a specific abnormal uh, factor involved. So, we get the same global structure. Um, and in this case, because of the causal law, it is possible to use the, the material of the causal explanation, the specific causal explanation, also to make a normal, a causal nomological explanation. Because we have a law, we can subsume the event under that. Uh, so um, it provides a specific causal explanation. Um, an explanation by causal specification, as it is also called, can be used to formulate a causal nomological explanation. And the principles involved in these three types of explanation are what I call heuristic methodological principles, so it are not laws, but it are, um, so the, this is the um, search principle, where actions are performed intentionally, people as a rule do not do things just for fun. Um, functional explanation, uh, traits of species, for instance, are functional, but um, they need not be functional, but biologists start for a long time to think it will be functional. If they do not succeed, they will in the end uh, search for why it may be not functional, but the, for instance a causal byproduct of something which is functional. Um, and similarly for causal, uh, uh, the causal heuristic methodological <coughs> principle, um, abnormal events have uh, abnormal causes. There are abnormal factors, causal factors involved. So such prin these principles are not law claims, but search principles or default rules. So they, they, when there is no specific reason to think otherwise, you keep think, hoping for a specification of this uh, idea. Now the later developments. So, so far about the two um, uh, main kinds of explanation, explanation by subsumption, explanation by um, specification. And let's now try to, uh, to confront that division with uh, more recent developments, recent, and I mean just what roughly happened, some of the main things that happened in the area of explanation after Nagel and Hempel. Well, one important thing, uh, uh, development was the unificationist theory of explanation uh, by uh, Philip Kitcher and um, Michael Friedman, later by Michael Friedman. Let's first uh, uh, immediately jump to that. According to these um, philosophers, um, explanation is only explanation when it is unifying. That's a kind of Necessary but also sufficient condition. At, but at, the most important thing is a necessary condition that defines an explanation. Now I think this is um, not really um, uh, well defensible. Because it's more a feature, a kind of as a as a rule. This occurs when you have a good explanation. Um, so if one has a theory that enables 
subsumption explanation of an empirical law. So according to roughly the steps we uh, I described in the explanation by subsumption, <coughs> then it's very likely that it enables the explanation of other empirical laws um, and whether or not they have already been established. And, um, and of course, for each of these specific explanations, you need a specific auxiliary hypothesis. And here are a number of examples which clearly show that um, uh, this well, produces, so to speak, a unifying character. If a, a, a theory really has hold on uh, empirical phenomena, then it's very unlikely that it will explain only one particular thing. Let, uh, I could put it in this way as well. So Newton's theory explains the law of free fall, the uh, orbits of the planets, the, the tides, and many more examples can be given. Um, so that's very much unifying. The kinetic theory of gases. If you look carefully to the ideal gas law, and this is just still one example, that is historically an enormous, um, let's say, condensed version of a number of uh, empirical laws, uh, partly dealing with drying the pressure, partly dealing with drying the, um, uh, the temperature. Um, so it um, is uh, also, it summarizes a bunch of laws, I have said. The periodic table. Uh, of chemical elements um, summarized an enormous amount of empirical findings, findings up to that moment that Mendeleev way with that theory. Mendel's theory, genetic theory, uh, um, um, explains a number of different laws about crossing uh, populations. So, then this is as far as the uh, unification is. And the other developments <coughs> have the emphasis on causal explanation. Um, the, we have um, the, well, Wesley Selman uh, first produced the so-called statistical relevance definition of causal explanation, but that was turned out even also uh, on his own standards uh, not satisfactory, and later he developed the causal mechanical theory of causal explanation. And, well, the idea is that this, um, and he, he downplayed, so to speak, the, the role of uh, laws that were involved in these kind of explanations. But I think if you look carefully to the causal mechanical theory, uh, so he claims that uh, laws are in, uh, then uh, not essential, but what is essential is describing the causal mechanism. So it may be a complex num a number of causal processes and their uh, interaction. Um, um, and well, later he added, as it were, a result criterion of statistical relevance to it. Um, so that, that's the basic idea. A causal explanation is making clear what the causal mechanism is, what produces a certain result. Now, in my view, it is a kind of a, a general version of explanation by causal specification. Because now, what the particular question is, what um, we suppose, if we have especially a kind of recurring phenomenon, we suppose there is a causal mechanism, and we want to find out which one. And there is a um, the assumption is, the, the heuristic methodological assumption is, there is a causal mechanism involved and the, our task is to specify it. So you can again, you get again an explanation by specification having a, this global structures and structure. And um, if you want to use that also to produce a deductive nomological explanation um, uh, to really derive the phenomenon that you want to explain, then you, uh, whatever Selman tells, you really will need the laws. Okay, now this leaves us with 
um, the question, what are causal explanations uh, we have now seen? Causal explanation by causal specification uh, in, the, <coughs> in, in the direction I described earlier or in the direction of causal mecha mechanistic specification um, and that enables the possibility of a uh, nomological explanation based on a causal law or theory because that was necessary for a causal explanation by specification. So the questions are, uh, what is an abnormal factor um, and what is a causal law? Um, now the development uh, known as the manipulationist or interventionist theory of causal explanation, first developed by Judea Pearl and later James Woodward, and the, the author at this moment about this subject is James Woodward. Um, and um, so the emphasis is put on that there is, uh, uh, in a causal explanation, there should be some uh, um, intervention of one kind or another and that may be an intervention by uh, of course that's the first thing to think of uh, by people but there are a kind of metaphysical metaphorical uses of the notion of intervention for instance the tsunami um, and uh, other types of abnormal factors that uh, are necessary and sufficient to produce uh, an explanation. And then, of course, we are back to um, um, the story about explanation by specification, uh, the interventions in the theory of uh, Pearl and Woodward are specific forms of um, uh, abnormal factors. Interventions are abnormal factors in the context of a bunch of normal factors. Okay, and then finally, a development, I will just briefly indicate, um, the idea is the following, let me just, um, don't read all the, the idea is, um, the, the question is, what precisely is a causal law? And there is, uh, not yet published, but it will be published soon in Erkenntnis, a paper by Julian Blondeau and Michael Jens, where they have a very specific intrinsic criterion of what makes a law a causal law. Assuming that um, they, they, they um, come from the natural sciences and they assume almost by definition that the basic kind of laws are in some way or other mathematically formulable. formulable, formulable. Um, and he gave an enormous amount of examples uh, where their uh, intrinsic criterion works. Um, so I, I list there the, on the second line the, the, the examples in physics, chemistry, epidemiology, demography, economics, etc. It's really impressive in the paper. They are all specified to some extent. In terms of Newton's um, theory, the idea may be the easiest to explain. The idea is, for a causal law, you not only need um, some time uh, involved, but even you need a, a, an equation having a, um, uh, 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 and you, you need, sorry, a differential equation, so having a, a derivative expression for the time, the time derivative is equalized with well, one or two or more um, factors. In the case of Newton's uh, second law, it is the time derivative of the momentum m times v, the mass times the velocity, um, the, 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 dif the time differential of that is equalized to the force and it, you get the standard expressions for when the mass is constant, we get 
that the mass times the acceleration is the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And so the idea is the, the force is the cause of the variation of the momentum, or more specifically when the mass is constant, the force is the cause, uh, sorry, is the, the velocity, no, sorry, the force is the cause of the variation of the velocity. And that's the, um, what is, uh, what is changed is the effect, what produces this change is the cause, that is the idea. Um, so, it is a formal criterion, and um, let me, well, because maybe if there are questions about, um, well, I think, so the idea is, the causal law is a mathematical law with time derivative, what, um, what, what is changed according to the time derivative, that is the effect, and what is on the other side of the equation, so to speak, that is the cause, or the, are the causal factors if there are more involved. And I think this is, as a sufficient condition, it's, I think, a very convincing case. I'm in doubt about whether it is a necessary condition, and I really think that what is necessary, um, and well, well, what is also uh, what you should think of is a kind of um, uh, that we also can deal with uh, non-continuous functions, but to talk in terms of discrete events that can be caused, as we are used in normal day life, we say well, an event is uh, caused by a certain um, other event, and there is a time sequence, etc. And the idea is, I think, uh, use, uh, interesting to work, uh, to elaborate, that what they conceive as the deemed intrinsic criterion is a kind of extreme version of a more general but intrinsic criterion, roughly according to their ideas. But, of course, this is a kind of, um, well, hypothesis I have in mind and I, uh, at the moment uh, I try to uh, elaborate that more but uh, it's uh, not this occasion to uh, go into details. So roughly speaking uh, the, the main division by subsumption and by specification uh, if you use that uh, these glasses so to speak to more recent developments you can um, locate, so to speak, all these developments roughly in this main division and that uh, is also my reason to think that this main division, so which I published about uh, in parts uh, already long before 2000, that what is um, summarized and, and presented, I think, for the, uh, well, the most elaborate way in um, uh, the book uh, Structures in Science uh, that is um, of 2001 but that is in 2012 still um, very useful. Thank you for your attention and uh, there are of course there's the possibility for uh, questions Go for uh, about uh, 10 minutes. So are there questions? Yes. I have a question. If you if you say explanation, uh, if you if you speak about explanation by subsumption, yeah. we assume uh, an theory, yes, uh, and law. But if if we we, we should have an idea of that law of theory. But what about explanation by specification? Does does not it involve and the idea of, of fear or, or law, because if we um, create, 
it will be some classification of some types. So we should be decide which features are important and which are not. And what what is the base of this the system? Um, well, I think um, in the case of um, explanation by causal specification, then you need a law that I said explicit there. But in the, the other sub-kinds, functional explanation and um, intentional explanation, I don't think you really need a law. And what is um, uh, only relevant is to um, uh, to find out what, uh, in the case of intentional explanation, what indeed the specific intention was, and maybe that uh, further questions can arise. How did this person come to this intention? What was was there a, a goal behind it or something? And in the case of functional explanation, of course, the, if you have answered convincingly why. Um, uh, an example I like very much, why sticklebacks move their fins very rapidly uh, uh, near the nest. Well, biologists found out that this is because to, in order to bring oxygen-rich uh, water to the nest, because that increases the chance of the, having uh, good offspring, etc. Now, the, the next question that arises, of course, how does this come about? Yeah. That, that's not really a, assuming a law. So I, I think it's not crucial. It's not crucial. And to, to find out well, what is relevant, what is uh, not, well, that is indeed a, a matter of formulating hypotheses and um, verifying or falsifying them. That's the, so there is a the hypothetical deductive element uh, involved in it. Okay. Who else? Yes, please. Well, maybe it is a little bit off the topic, but in terms of uh, that phenomenon that you want to explain, do you see any role of natural kinds in the explanation? Um, um, well, I, I'm indeed hesitant about, uh, well, of course, the notion of natural kind is in practically very useful. But I don't think there is a good reason to think in terms of um, really a sharp uh, distinction between natural kinds. There is a, a, a fluid line between different natural kinds, etc. So, Although, so, so I think, um, especially for instance, these functional explanations are very much guided by um, ideas about natural kinds. You know, think in terms of well, this kind of um, fish, um, um, sticklebacks, is a natural kind in this sense. Produces has that that and that behavior. But um, um, I, I do not think it, uh, it plays a, uh, an, a crucial role in the sense of that it says, well, you have to stick up back, they do that, and others will not do that. But it's per perfectly possible that you will find the same behavior in other uh, biological species. So a it plays a practical role, but I don't think a, a really a fundamental role. But you would dispute, I think. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's it. Okay. Well, well, yes. One more. Um, when you were speaking about intentions, yeah. would you say that you that we are looking for a specific cause or factor, or would you rather say that we that we are looking for a, a class of certain factors? When you uh, talking about an intentional explanation, yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, um, at first, you, I think, certainly look for one particular intention. If people perform a, a very particular action, um, so for instance, somebody opens that window, the question is, why did he do that? Um, and there will be a specific reason why, why he did it. Um, but of course, the research may um, make clear that he had more than one intention. So, but that's something for later development. So if you have an intentional explanation, yeah, I said that at the end, that it raises new questions. And the new questions, one of them, was that the only intention may be others. But the, let's say, the basic um, phenomenon is, is one intention, but it, you may be right that there are more intentions involved. That's, uh, and as similarly for causal fact, abnormal causal factors, of course, usually an accident is, uh, occurs due to a particular specific problem in the context of normal conditions. But it may be a uh, coming together of two abnormal factors. Both sides of the 